Tunnel Rams rule. Check out this test. Tunnel Ram versus a single plane and a dual plane. And also, I'm going to throw in an exhaust test. Hey, guys. Thanks for joining me. I'm Richard Holdner, and welcome to the channel. Today, it's all about Tunnel Rams. That's right. Tunnel Rams like this one right up here. We're going to compare an old-school Edelbrock TR1 Y dual quad Tunnel Ram to an RPM air gap dual plane intake manifold and a Victor Junior single plane intake manifold. The question is, which one of these intakes makes more power? Who cares? We get to run a tunnel ram. Okay, guys, let's jump right in. Small block Chevy intake manifold time. We've got a dual plane. We've got a single plane. And the coolest thing of all, we have a dual quad tunnel ram. That's right. Our test motor was the world famous, the original Gladiator. Now they have the Gladiator 2, which has probably as many or, or maybe even more runs. Back in the day, this uh, Gladiator 350 actually was a 355 because it had been uh, bored out and they put uh, new pistons in it so that we could run with valve relief, so that we could run camshafts. This thing was about 10 and a half to one. It had a set of uh, Airflow Research 190 heads that had been, you know, given the work over treatment, so they were working pretty well. I think that those heads have been milled slightly too um, during their period of life on this test motor, which it ran lots and lots, like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dyno passes. This thing had an MSD distributor. It had a pretty good sized camshaft in it. It was 236, 242. It was 555 to 560 lift. This thing had 1.6 uh, roller rockers on it. It had the, our inch and three quarter long tube, um, like sprint car headers on it. Let's see. It had a, um, you can see, I, I'll put a photo up here of the uh, timing. Normally we use a double roller timing chain, but this had a cam belt on an adjustable one so that we could, you know, externally adjust the cam timing stuff, which was fairly cool. So this thing had a lot of good stuff on it, and it was a perfect little hot test motor to try to test all of these different intake manifolds. And we started off our first test with an RPM air gap, which is kind of the go-to dual plane intake manifold for a lot of small block Chevy applications, even one with a good camshaft and compression, good heads on it like this. And we'll take a look at see how that compares, single plane, dual plane, and a tunnel ram. So starting off with our dual plane RPM air gap, we also ran the single plane and the dual plane with an 850 Holley carburetor. Obviously, did jetting and timing swoops to make sure that this thing was going to run. But take a look at this power curve. This thing made 493 horsepower uh, with the dual plane and 431 foot pounds of torque. It looks like we might have been running into a valve spring problem of 63, 6400 RPM. This thing may have continued to climb. Uh, with this much camshaft and this and these airflow research heads, which, which we know work very well, especially on this kind of 350, 355 combination. I think maybe we were running into a little bit of a valve float issue. That, that's what the power curve looks like. But now let's take a look and see what happens when we run the, let's compare this to the single plane Victor Junior intake manifold. Again, the two kind of quintessential single plane, dual plane deals. And this did exactly what we expect and have come to expect when we do single plane versus dual plane combinations. The single plane made more power at the top. In fact, this thing reached right at 500 horsepower, 500.6. <laughs> so you can round that up to 501 if you want. And oddly enough, and this is where a, a lot of guys get in trouble, is that they think that the dual plane, oh, this is made for torque. And it did indeed make more low speed torque from 5,300 and down, the dual plane, definitely the way to go. And that was about the crossover point. And then above that, the single plane made a little bit more. But if you look in terms of peak torque, the 4, 431 for the RPM air gap for the dual plane and 430 foot pounds for the single plane. So they both made right, right at the same peak torque. It's just one made it much more low speed power in the case of the dual plane and the single plane made more power on the top end. So again, it's always a choice. Where do you want to produce your power and pick your intake manifold according? But now let's take a look and see what happens when we installed our old school Elbrock tunnel ram. Okay, guys, we've taken a look at the comparison between the dual plane RPM air gap and then the single plane Victor Jr. Now let's jump right in and get to what everybody came for. That's the tunnel ram. This particular tunnel ram was an old school Edelbrock TR1Y. In fact, I think this one belonged to David Freiberger way back in the day. Like I said, this thing was ran back in the back in the 2000s, right, <laughs> right after y, Y2K. And we equipped this uh, Edelbrock uh, 
with the Holley linkage that we normally use. And then we ran two Holley 650 carburetors on it, which is, again, more than enough to feed the kind of power output that we were talking about. And this was an interesting thing. I, I've never come across uh, dyno results like this running a tunnel ram. I've run lots of tunnel rams on small blocks and big blocks and various things. But here's what happened when we ran this Edelbrock tunnel ram. You can see this is compared to the single plane. The single plane actually made a little bit peak, a little bit more peak power. The the Edelbrock made 491 foot pounds, but as you can see, made a lot more torque than the single plane did. In fact, it made the most torque of of either one of the intake manifolds, and I'll show you a comparison between the the RPM air gap too. But made 448 foot pounds and 491 horsepower. Now I've never seen the tunnel ram not make more power than the single plane in all the testing, but this is what we see here. You can see that the tunnel ram did better than the single plane from six, uh, everything below 6,000 basically, everything below 6,000 RPM, which goes to show you that a lot of people tend to think, hey, tunnel ram, that's a high RPM race only deal. No, actually it has long runners. It actually works very well in the middle part of the curve. Now let's take a look. I'll get rid of the Victor Jr. here and we'll bring up the RPM air gap. So I'll go ahead and label these so you can see, but basically the RPM air gap did make a little bit more power down low. In fact, down below 4,200, the RPM air gap maybe uh, better in terms of torque production down there, probably maybe better on, on carb signal down there too, but from 4,500 or so, at least out to 6,300, the tunnel ram was quite a bit better, made made quite a bit more torque. Like I said, 431 foot pounds for the RPM air gap, 400, <laughs> excuse me, 448 foot pounds for the tunnel ram. But again, oddly enough, out at the top, even the RPM air gap made a little bit more peak power than the tunnel ram, which makes me think that something was kind of going on there at the top. <laughs> Let me know in the comments what you guys think. Have you run tunnel rams before? Have you ever seen the tunnel ram not make more power than an RPM air gap? or even then a single plane Victor Jr. intake manifold. But I ran a lot of other tests when we had these combinations up on the dyno. In fact, I may do a second video on this. We ran a bunch of spacers and, and various tests with the different intake manifolds. So I might include that. But now let's take a look and see what happened when I did an exhaust test, uh, an exhaust system test on the tunnel ramp. Let's take a look. Okay, now we've taken a look at what the effects the tunnel arm has compared to the single plane and the dual plane on this uh, 355 Chevy. Let's take a look at a test that I did. This is interesting, and uh, this goes to show what happens when you're changing, uh, making changes in the exhaust system and how they affect the power curve. So what we did was, I'm going to show you a photo here of the header, the sprint car style header that we run on the engine dyno on most small block Chevys, just because it's easy to access everything, basically. But if you'll notice, we've got a muffler uh, on the end of the collector, and there's no collector extension uh, per se that we add on. This is just part of the part of the header, but it has a fairly long collector extension on it, and it works fairly well. But adding the muffler, <laughs> uh, or, or should I say, in this case, taking the muffler away because we ran all this test, all these testings with our big high flow muffler on it, but then taking the muffler away to see if we could add power, you know, to get rid of the muffler because mufflers are worth power. <laughs> I'll show you what happens when we do the muffler removal. So this is our combination with the muffler on, and here's our combination with the muffler off. And I go ahead and label these. So what happens is we had a dramatic change in the curve at least below 5,000 RPM. Up above that, it had no effect on power. So it didn't change the peak power really at all. All of that from 5,000 to 6,500 or so, that was basically all the same. But below that point, we had a big change in power. So what it did initially at 3,000, uh, from 3,000 to 4,000 lost a bunch of torque. And the reason for that is because we've shortened the effective uh, collector extension length. So it lost a bunch of torque, but <laughs> rebounded back after 4,000, from 4,000 to 5,000, removing the muffler actually picked up a little bit of torque. So if you're looking to make changes in the curve, maybe you're looking to change the stall speed or the launch or the 60 foot time, you can see there's no change in power. So where you're revving it, you know, where you'd normally be revving it for the rest of the race, it works pretty well. But you can see by adjusting the collector length on the header, <laughs> 
we can see we can have a pretty big change in power. So you get to pick which one of these would you want. Obviously, <laughs> some sort of sliding exhaust system because that's what's really happening here. This isn't a function of the muffler doing anything trick. It's not a... Um, uh, any sort of weird reflected wave happening because the inside of the muffler what this is and we would do the same thing because I've done this test many times before if you just extend the collector length with a length of tubing that is the length of that muffler we see exactly the same thing this is just a collector length extension thing and actually if you were to run a full length exhaust once you get to a certain point there's no more change so once you go from about I don't know three or four feet to 20 feet there's no change except the change that you might get from a change in flow rate from having that much tubing but this is an interesting thing muffler versus no muffler big change in power at least below 5000 rpm but that's our test for today i'm richard holder please make sure to like share subscribe ring the bell do all that stuff and i'll keep testing